Good morning, everyone. I hope you're well. I'm Dr. Arya, and I'm a high performance psychologist. And today I'm doing a fit and well takeover, looking at some of the new research by Yakult on gut health and the gut brain connection. Um, thank you, Libby, for joining. Uh, so the talk today is going to be uploaded to IGTV and the YouTube channels afterwards, so you can view it again at a later date. Um, I'll maybe just give people a few minutes to um, log in. Uh, feel free to post any um, questions or comments uh, as we go along and I'll try and cover them. This IG Live will be around the connection of the gut-brain axis and the scientific link between the gut and the brain and why it's important. Um, hello Libby. And yeah, we'll look at some of the lifestyle factors and stress and how that can actually impact your gut health um, and what we can do to nurture our gut health. So we'll just get straight into it. Um, the research from Yakult found that, you know, 92% of us regularly use phrases such as um, to describe gut feelings, you know, having butterflies in your stomach being the most common, about 52% of people related to that having a gut feeling or gut instinct, 49% um, of people, and then feeling gutted. So I'm sure these are all, you know, different um, expressions and feelings that we can all relate to. And, you know, I think the interesting part is we rarely really pause to question the basis of our language and our experiences. Um, phrases like having guts, listening to, listening to your guts have been a part of everyday language for hundreds of years, but you know, you might want to take a minute and just consider why is it that when you feel anxious, when you're feeling stressed, uh, even if you're happy or you're excited, that you actually feel it in your gut. And the reason is there's biology at work. So we can now actually explain gut feelings and gut instinct from this scientific lens with the gut-brain axis, which we'll keep on talking about. But essentially, it's the direct connection between the gut and the brain. And this is an important area because the research from Yakult found that while 96% of us admit to following our gut instincts, at least some of the time, nearly half of us don't know that there's a real connection between our gut and the brain. And under a third of us have actually even heard of the gut-brain axis. So let's look, we'll look at the science now and cover a little bit, a bit about that because I think then that makes it more understandable. Essentially, a brain communicates with all of the organs in our body and it'll send messages out through a network of nerves. And it's a little bit like um, branches in a tree. They're all spread out. Now, the gut is the only organ that has its own local nervous system. It's called the enteric nervous system. And it controls its own actions, such as digesting your food. And that's why the gut is often referred to as a second brain. Now, the fascinating part is the gut and the brain are constantly in close communication with each other. They essentially talk to each other back and forth on a regular basis. And it's this close relationship is this complex communication network that we call the gut-brain axis. So, you know, we can start to ask if the brain and the gut do talk, what language do they speak? And essentially the gut and the brain have a direct physical connection, which is called the vagus nerve. And this vagus nerve will carry messages continuously back and forth from the brain to the gut, back to the brain, and so on and so forth. And the main language is through chemical messengers, which are known as neurotransmitters, and examples would be serotonin and dopamine. And you've probably heard about these. We read about them in the press all the time. Um, they're brain chemicals. They're often described as happiness or feel-good hormones because they influence our mood and our emotions. Now, the incredible part is that these neurotransmitters are produced by gut cells and by the trillions of microbes that actually live in our gut, which are known as gut microbiota. So they, they're produced 
within the gut. Um, and fascinatingly, over 90% of the serotonin in our body is produced in the gut. And that has an impact, of course, um, on the brain, which is why these gut to brain signals influence our emotions, influence our mood, and they influence the decisions that we make. Uh, so that is the gut brain axis. If you have any questions on that, feel free to ask. Um, but we'll now look at okay, so what factors can actually impact the health of the gut? And the one that's been looked at the most has been nutrition. You know, there's a large body of evidence showing that the foods that we eat have a strong influence on our gut microbes. And you've probably heard that greater diversity of microbiota has been linked to better health. So if we want more diversity, how and how can we then improve our gut health through nutrition? Essentially, it's eating a wide range of fiber-rich foods, such as vegetables, fruits, beans, um, whole grains. So really sort of returning to nature's wisdom. Um, thank you, Maddie, for asking about sleep. I will definitely come on to that. Um, it's about also having maybe omega-3 fats, maybe from oily fish, um, and fermented foods can be great, including dairy products, um, kimchi, tempeh. Um, I might actually just cover sleep now, Maddie, because you probably uh, want to know about it. So we know that um, the gut microbiome can uh, influence sleep quality. So previous studies have shown that sleep deprivation um, and the human microbiome are linked. Now, some of the research has been conflicting, but there was a recent study and it found that sleep deprivation actually leads to changes um, in gut microbiome composition. Um, while, you know, while other studies have found there hasn't been a link, but so the relationship is unclear. But we do know in terms of other data that your microbiome diversity is related to your sleep efficiency and your total sleep time. Um, so how much time you spend in bed, but also your efficiency, you know, how quickly you're dropping off to sleep, how much sleep you're having during the night and your total sleep time does appear to have uh, an impact. And whenever they're looking at um, like analyzing their, their kind of different strands um, of bacterioiditis and firmicutes, in case uh, you wanted to know the uh, kind of exact science of it. And so it does seem that, yeah, microbiome, sleep physiology, um, and even the immune system are all linked. So we'll head back to other factors. So we know that nutrition plays a massive part. In terms of like non-dietary lifestyle factors, uh, the three most relevant to people in the UK would probably be smoking, exercise, and stress. So the research indicates that smoking has a significant impact on gut microbiota composition. Um, no problem, Maddie. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, we know that smoking all virtually affects every cell in the body. Um, exercise, or rather a lack of it, is important as well. We know that whenever there's been data just showing that when people increase the amount of exercise, that can have impacts on diversity of um, gut micro populations. Um, and then stress appears to have an impact uh, and it can alter the microbiome uh, profiles. So if we look at stress, because I think that's the one that's probably um, can impact most of us, how do we even like, understand stress? Well, you can look at it in different ways, but to, you know, in terms of like everyday language, essentially when we talk about feeling stressed, it generally re reflects a situation in which our perceived demands are outweighed by our perceived resources or our perceived ability to cope. So essentially, um, we feel like our circumstances are, are too tough to handle that we don't have the ability to, to cope with it. And, you know, there was a huge, it was the largest study of stress levels in the UK by the Mental Health Foundation. And they found that 74% of people reported feeling so stressed that they felt overwhelmed or unable to cope. 
Now, stress is a tricky one because whenever we feel stressed, uh, we tend to drink more alcohol, we tend to sleep less, and we tend to exercise less. And so actually managing stress can be critical to improving our gut health and our mental well-being. Um, so in terms, you know, if stress does have this impact, what can be sort of the solution? Well, at the core of stress management, it's essentially about building emotional resilience. And I'll define resilience as the ability to accept, understand, process and grow through pain. Because reality is, we all experience pain in life. It's inevitable. Um, we, you know, life doesn't always go the way that we want it to or expect it to. We'll all face unexpected, unwanted events in life. Um, you know, we've particularly, and I think in the last, you know, in the last year, uh, with the lockdown, with the pandemic, um, I think that's really highlighted uh, how much is outside of our control and how big of an impact it has. And even outside of that, we all lose someone that we love, whether it's through death or the end of a relationship. Um, some of us are single and we'd want to be in a relationship. Even when you're in a relationship, um, it's not easy, is it? Um, we have relationship difficulties. We can often think our life will pan out a certain way, but then as a couple, we might struggle to conceive or you have children and then they become sick. Um, or there's just, you know, job challenges and then markets crash and there's financial uncertainty. So it is inevitable. But by living out certain principles, we can begin to understand and accept and process and grow through this pain. And so my work as a psychologist involves helping people to go through different principles so they can manage stress better. And they can also develop this more robust sense of, of self that is increasingly independent of external situations so that whatever life throws at you, rather than reacting from thoughts and emotions, you can actually act from a place of grounded objectivity and wisdom. Um, so there's so much to cover, but I'll just give you a, a simple ABC framework, which you can use, and this can help you to manage stress, uh, which will then nurture your gut brain axis and lead to other uh, health benefits too. So the A is for to allow. So the first step is to continually allow whatever thoughts and emotions you experience in a stressful situation to arise and to allow them to pass too. And so, you know, we've heard a lot about mindfulness, about acceptance of the present moment. Um, but sometimes that might seem like quite a sort of um, uh, cerebral idea. Essentially, it means that whatever comes up within you, whatever thoughts you have, just allow it, to, allow it to arise and allow it to pass. It isn't actually about doing anything. It's about undoing what we typically do. And generally, people often fall into one of three traps. Usually, they'll try to avoid the pain. So the first trap, when it comes to stress, is trying to avoid a painful experience. Because what happens is it's arising anyway, and then we try and block it. We try and deny it, escape it. Um, we essentially push it back down. So it's coming up, but then we push it back down and we bury it deep inside us. But when we do that, the, uh, the energy associated with stress can actually build. And then what happens is we often end up, well, like closing ourselves off, disengaging from others, feels that like we're carrying this heavy burden. And even the, the emotions can then seep out in different ways in the future. Uh, the second mistake people make is we fuse with the pain. So... We're feeling the pain, but then we feed it and we elaborate it and we might, there might be a story going on in our head and then we turn it into a, we follow it down every rabbit hole, wherever the mind goes, we, we follow it down and then we, we build up this, um, you know, we, we look at the what if, what if this happens, what if that happens, we focus on the regret and then we act out of the pain and the emotion. And we generally know that whenever we act from pain or anger or frustration or hurt. I mean, anytime you've ever had an argument and you've got angry, how's it ended? We rarely come from a place of love and compassion and understanding once emotion gets involved. And so it's about allowing these thoughts and emotions to come and go. And the third, so fusing with the pain and acting from the pain would be the third. So an analogy that I use is that 
you're like the sky and your thoughts and emotions are the clouds. Now, sometimes there are dark, huge, forbearing, brooding clouds. Sometimes they're light and wispy. But the sky and the clouds are separate. And in the same way, you're not your thoughts and emotions. You will have a thought and it will go. Every thought you've ever had has come and passed. Every emotion you've ever felt has come and passed. But you've remained here. So, so even from that, we know logically that you're not your thoughts and emotions. You're the observer of them. You're the witness of them. And so you're the sky and your thoughts and emotions are the clouds. And it's about allowing them to arise and allowing them to pass. So that's the A. Uh, the B is to breathe to take a moment to breathe. Now, breathing probably sounds overly simple, but, you know, whenever we think about it, there's a reason why breathing or breath work is literally the foundation of uh, meditative, contemplative, um, yogic traditions to mindfulness. And the breath is always with us. It's like a trusted companion. It's an anchor that we can use to ground ourselves in the present moment. It can just, even now, if you want, just, you know, take a moment to tap into your breath and it can slow you down. It can give you space. And we know that actually, even from the scientific research, that when we focus on the breath and keep on bringing our attention back to the breath, it can actually reduce the negative emotional response to difficulties by 20%. So it helps us to better regulate our emotions. And I think a key part of it is that whenever we lengthen our exhale, we actually increase activity in that vagus nerve, which is part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And that actually cr creates this calming feeling by slowing down the heart rate, decreasing blood pressure, relaxing our muscles, and reducing activity in the brain linked to emotions. So I'll use something called the 4-8 technique. Essentially breathe in for four, and then exhale for eight seconds. And I'll often breathe in through my nose and out through my mouth. And if you purse your lips a little bit like you're going to whistle, um, that can help in terms of lengthening the exhale. So if you just do even a single breath now, I know that we're um, kind of over time, but I'll, I'll be wrapping up soon. Um, you know, just take a moment, just settle into the present moment, find a posture that, you know, is relaxed. If you can, relax your shoulders. But feel like a sort of dignified position, so I might be having your back straight, and just bring your attention to your breath. And just follow your breath as the air enters through your nose. And follow the exhale as it leaves your mouth. And if you want, just notice your abdomen as it rises with the in-breath, and as it falls with the out-breath. And if your mind wanders, that's totally fine. You don't have to judge yourself. Just bring your attention back to the breath. And in a minute, I'll just lead us on a single breath by counting in for four and out for eight. So if you're ready, breathe in, two, three, four, and out, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that was just one simple mindful breath using four, eight, um, and I start the day in the morning by doing 10. But even if you want to do three or five, it's a very simple technique you can do anywhere. And the C, so A is for allowing, allowing any thoughts to, or emotions to arise and allowing them to pass. The breathe is to connect to your breath, anchoring, your, anchoring yourself in the present moment. And the C is to choo choose, to see that we have a choice. We can choose what to focus on. And when we don't have awareness, the mind automatically tends to focus on what's missing, what we cannot control, and negative outcomes in the past or the future. And what we want to do is we want to flip that on its head. We want to develop more emotional resilience by shifting our focus to one, what's working, two, what I can control, and three, any positive opportunities now. And a question that I'll ask myself often during the day is, throughout the day, multiple times, is how can I nourish my mind today? Or how can I nourish my body today? Or what does my mind need right now? Or what does my body need right now? And that will vary depending on how you're feeling and what you, know, what you have upcoming um, and the place that you're in. So it'll be 
very responsive to what you need. You know, it might be walking or running or it could be or it could be resting. It might be hitting the gym or doing yoga or it could be having a power nap. It might be being outdoors in nature. It could be running a bath. Um, it could be speaking to friends or it might be having time on your own. So, um, or it might be listening to music or just going out and listening to nature. But you'll know what's right for you whenever you uh, set that intention to try and understand what do I need right now. So, just to sum up, A, allow any thoughts and emotions to arise. B, breathe. And C, choose where to place your attention. So, thank you so much for joining me. I hope, um, I hope that's been useful. Um, and that you've maybe picked up some understanding of the science behind the gut and the brain connection, um, understanding, you know, from the research by Yaka, why, uh, why this is important. Uh, if you do actually do want to understand the gut brain axis, uh, even better, there's a really good three minute video on the Yaka YouTube section. Um, ah, oh, thank you, Maddie. Um, on the on the YouTube section, which you can um, just check out, but it's um, it gives a really good simple overlay to it, and hopefully you got some simple science based based ways to nourish uh, your gut and your brain. So thanks, guys. I hope you have a wonderful day, and I'll see you guys soon.